Okay, welcome to CS4510, and I think this is 8-1. Now, this is just sort of like, I don't want to say extra, but it's uh, not covered or anything. It's just sort of a good recap of everything we've done so far. And it's going to be called, I guess I'm going to call it some decidable Uh, languages. So what Sipser does is actually he proves these languages are decidable before giving you an example of an undecidable language. Um, and because I don't want to, you know, miss anything, I'm just going to cover them. And I, I might as well use one lecture to do it. So consider the language ADFA, uh, which stands for acceptance. So ADFA consists of encodings of a DFA and a word W such that uh, D uh, uh, on W will accept. Also, I'm just going to basically prove several languages in a row. Uh, and what I want you to do is pause the video and think about uh, how this could be accepted or rejected or if this is a decidable language or, you know, things like this. I want, it's a good recap. There's no, there shouldn't be any new information today. Um, this is a decidable language. Why? Well, uh, D on W uh, runs in exactly uh, the length of W steps, right? So we can create a decider for this, which uh, simulates D for exactly that number of steps. Create a decider or ADFA, which uh, simulates uh, D, well, simulates uh, W on D for exactly uh, D. Well, excuse me, excuse me, uh, for exactly the length of W steps. If uh, D W accepts, then accept. If uh, D W rejects, Uh, then reject. So here, A stood for accept, and then the computational model is the subscript. So consider A and F A. A similar problem. We have an encoding of an NFA, uh, a word W, such that the NFA on W accepts. Is this decidable? Uh, yes, it is. You might think, well, and DFAs or NFAs are equal in power. Uh, for each DFA, there's an NFA. So maybe uh, it should be the same, right? So let's call this decider, uh, let's call this M1. Right, I'm going to have several deciders throughout the uh, lecture today, so might as well start numbering them. So, here's our decider. Uh, let M2 uh, be our uh, decider for uh, A NFA. What M2 is going to do, M2 converts... Uh, N to a DFA uh, D uh, then runs uh, M1 on uh, D comma W and returns what M1 returns.
So we've sort of converted this problem of solving an NFA, determining if an NFA accepts, to converting it to a DFA and then determining if the DFA accepts. So to draw this pictorially, what we have is a, uh, we have M1 here. Uh, we're going to have like a, a DFA, no, an NFA to DFA box to a DFA box. Right, so we're, what we're gonna do, and here's uh, what we're calling this M2. So uh, on input uh, D comma W, so excuse me, N comma W goes in. We, I'll write, I'll draw it with dotted lines, so like this. So uh, D is N is going to go into the NFA to DFA converter. W is going to just get passed to M1, and then we're just going to return what these return, right? So now this is going to be D, and this is going to be W, and this is going to be if it, it whatever that returns. So we've re sort of reduced this problem of of determining if an NFA can accept to the problem if a, if a DFA can accept. Similarly, I don't even have to do the proofs. Similarly, uh, a rex um, such that such that uh, r uh, comma w such that r uh, generates is. Uh, this is also decidable. Same for A and uh, regular grammar equals uh, G comma W such that uh, G generates W. We just convert them all. We can reduce all these problems to the fact that we solved uh, the DFA problem. Right. Here's an interesting one. Now let's let's change topics a little bit. We'll do we'll, we'll say EDFA is determining if the DFA accepts the empty language. So such that uh, uh, D is a DFA and the language of D is equal to uh, the empty set. So once again, pause the video and ask yourself if this is decidable or not. It is. And uh, think about what this this algorithm is actually much, a little trickier uh, than the acceptance one. So think about how we could determine this language always. The idea is we're going to use something similar to garbage collection. If you under, if you know anything about how that works, we sort of are going to mark the start state and then uh, mark all the states that could be connected to the start state. And then uh, if we don't mark any new states and no final states have been marked then we know a final state the final states are completely unreachable right a dfa doesn't have to be connected it's just assumed that if you have a final state that it's reachable in every dfa we've drawn but there's nothing wrong with having a dfa like this i mean there's something wrong with it but this is a valid dfa right it's just the final states are unreachable so what we're going to do is uh mark uh the start state And then while no new states are marked uh, for all right this way for each state if state has incoming arrow uh, from marked state uh, mark or we'll call each state s mark s and then we repeat this and then when we're done 
if no final state is marked except uh, D. So this is a decider clearly for EDFA. So it, it is decidable. Uh, here's another problem. EQ uh, DFA. It asks for the encoding of two DFAs. We'll call them D1, uh, D2, such that the language of D1 is equal to the language of D2. Before I continue, actually, I just remembered something. Uh, these two problems, by the way, this is also decidable. These are decidable from another method uh, than what's given in the book because we have the power of the myhill nerode theorem. Uh, I didn't talk about it exactly, but the myhill nerode theorem implies the existence of this algorithm which can minimize a DFA. So each regular language can be uh, uniquely described as a unique and minimal DFA. So what you do is you take the equivalence classes of the language and then you reconstruct the DFA and it probably will have less states than the one you're given. Uh, so what you, what you would do here for this one if, to determine this language is you take the DFA, you apply the minimization algorithm, and you're going to be left with, with the DFA for the empty language, which is going to be a single state. You could do the same thing here as well. What you do is you minimize, you apply this algorithm to D1 and D2, and you determine if the two uh, DFAs are isomorphic in sort of a colored graph isomorphic sense. And then you get the you get the, the same thing. So that's one way the myhill neurode could be used to show decidability of these two languages. But these algorithms are much neater, I think. So we're going to reduce this problem actually to uh, EDFA. So we construct the symmetric difference of uh, D1 and D2. So the symmetric difference of D1. I'll call it a triangle, and D2 is equal basically to like, it's like an XOR, essentially. We, we do one or the other, but not both. So we have this, we have this. So the symmetric difference is then this. Doesn't It's one, the other, or not both. So you could write this as like L uh, D1 union L uh, D2. And then what you do is you, you take away the intersection. So you say L D1 intersect L uh, D2, right? That's one way to, certainly one way to write it. Another way to write it though, is you could write this as uh, L of D1 intersect L of D2 complement or L D, excuse me L uh, D1 complement intersect uh, L of D2 right so another thing to note here is that uh, the symmetric difference is it's, it's like a difference, right? So L of D1 difference L of D2 is equal to the empty set uh, if and only if uh, L of D1 equals L of D2. This is also, if you notice, a composition of regular operations. We've proved this a long time ago. Intersection, complement, union, and then there's this composition with parentheses. So here's our decider for EQDFA. Uh, decider for EQDFA. Uh, uh, construct a DFA. We'll call it D3. We'll call it DFA D3 because we have D1, D2 which is equal to the uh, symmetric difference of these two.
Okay, that step is valid. You can always do that. Uh, then we're going to run d3 on decider of etm. Excuse me, e uh, tfa. Uh, so I'm going to say return whatever EDFA returns. Return whatever EDFA decider returns. So we've again, we've reduced the problem uh, solved one problem using a solver for another problem. So I have to draw it with the box at this point. So uh, let's say our box looks like this. Uh, this is going to be the decider for EDFA. And uh, we're going to take on input uh, two DFAs, and we're trying to determine if they have the same language, right? So this is going to be D1, we'll say this is D2. And then we're going to convert it into, uh, through our non-trivial, uh, but it, it's, it corrects, it's correct and it exists, DFA for the symmetric difference. And we're going to just push that right into EDFA. So I'll call this the triangle. And then this is going to be T3. Then to wire everything up, we got going like this. Got going like this. And uh, this will decide uh, E, Q, uh, DFA. Okay, now let's talk about um, some context-free grammar stuff. Right, so let's talk about A, uh, C, F, G. This is going to be defined exactly how you think G is a is a context-free grammar. W is a word such that uh, G uh, generates W. Now, the whole point of me proving, of, of talking about Chomsky normal form, is that it gives you an algorithm to determine acceptance. So this is also, this is decidable. If G is in uh, Chomsky normal form and the length of the word uh, is of length uh, of length N, then W uh, should take exactly uh, 2 to the N minus 1 derivations or productions. So what's our uh, decider here? Uh, our decider is as follows. Uh, convert uh, G to uh, CNF form. Uh, produce a list of all words of length w. I will call it uh, big W. And then we accept uh, if and only if uh, w is in big W. So using the grammar, we can produce uh, the set of strings of the same length as w, and each one will take two to the n minus one derivations. So the whole thing will take so many steps. And then from there, we just check if it's in that list or not. So this will this process will always halt and we can always determine for each w and uh, 
it and its complement, right? So it has to be decidable. Now consider um, E uh, CFG, which is equal to some grammar uh, such that uh, G, the language of G is uh, the empty language, right? So if you recall, I asked you to give, there might have either a homework or an exam question to give a, give a uh, context-free grammar for the empty set. And the, if you recall, the, the idea was just, you know, not to have this production end. Because as soon as you end, that implies you have a string of terminals, right? Because a non and the existence of a non-terminal in your work tape means you have to keep going. You have to keep producing it into something. So example grammars were like S goes to S or like S goes to A, uh, A goes to S, right? So sort of like infinite loops kind of thing. There are infinitely many grammars who can do this. And determining if a grammar uh, accepts the empty set is a decidable language. So this is decidable. So, I guess, so, so, so this is a decidable. What we're going to do is sort of do like a reverse uh, search. So what we did earlier, if you recall, where we mark the nodes, yeah. This is sort of like a breath first search where we sort of we mark something and then we just check if it's marked then okay we keep going. This is going to be sort of like a reverse breath first search. So uh, I'm going to say mark all uh, terminals uh, while uh, no new non-terminals are marked uh, if A goes to a st string of all marked so the right hand side of A of the rule A goes to something then we mark A And then we repeat this until every until no new things have been marked or not marked. So we start sort of from the leaves of this. If you think of the uh, tree, we start from the leaves and we try and go backwards. We will work our, our way back up to the root. And if we could reach the start symbol, then that implies that the something was produced by this grammar. So. Uh, we, uh, we accept only if the start symbol uh, was not marked. So, accept if and only if start symbol not marked. Okay? And by a similar algorithm, you could also determine if... Uh, the you could come up with a decider for uh, context-free grammars whose languages are not empty, right? So now here comes a sort of a tricky thing, a, a tricky part. What about uh, EQ uh, CFG? Take a second to think uh, about this one. If you recall, we uh, did for EQ DFA, we came up with a symmetric difference. Uh, idea and then we applied that but we cannot we cannot do the same because context-free grammars are not closed under complement they're also not closed under intersection so we couldn't apply the same idea first of all second of all more importantly it's undecidable the proof of which will require uh, tools from next lecture but for now, we can just say it's undecidable. As some more corollaries, we had, um, as a last thing, I'll say that every context-free language is decidable. Every CFG is uh, decidable. If you recall our big, uh, nice uh, Chomsky hierarchy Venn diagram thing, I put the uh, CFGs as decidable languages, right?
So this is regular, this is CFG, this is decidable, and this is uh, a recognizable. And there exists languages here, 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 and here. But I'm going to justify this to you in two ways, why every CFG is, de is decidable. First of all, you can convert uh, each uh, CF uh, L has a PDA simulate PDA on a tape on a Turing machine's tape that's sort of easy right you, you just sort of copy the topology of the state diagram and then you make instead of moving left and moving right you make this whole thing about okay I'm erasing if I want to pop, I'm going to erase the character and then move right or something, right? Uh, but there's another way. There's another way, and we can use the decider uh, for ACFG. So this is uh, way one. Way two is we can use the decider for ACFG. So here's our Turing machine. So M, I don't know, three on input uh, W. Uh, run decider on G comma W and accept uh, if and only if uh, the decider accepts. So using the decider for ACFG, because ACFG was decidable, we were able to decide every context-free language, in fact. Okay, this was just sort of a short detour, some good practice. Nothing here should be totally new, uh, but uh, it's good to give some examples of decidable languages before this next lecture where we go off and talk about undecidable languages and how can you prove uh, languages, more tools to prove languages are undecidable. The only language so far that we know is undecidable is HALT and technically it's complement. So I'm going to give you a way, uh, an easy proof method to prove um, more languages are undecidable.